Good evening, and welcome to Victorian Story Hour. I am your host, the storyteller, and this is The Archives, where I endeavor to collect and share tales from around the world. Tonight we have something of a theme, dealings with dark creatures and hunts of prolonged time. Three tales. We shall begin first with a poem by Poe, but a tale by Hoffman, one from Perrault, and finally one of my personal favorites from the Empire of Russia. If there is time, we shall read some more of the diary. So, as we have much to cover, let us begin. First, from Master Poe, The Haunted Palace. In the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace, reared its head. In the monarch thought's dominion, it stood there. Never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious golden, on its roof did float and flow this all this was in the olden time long ago, and every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, along the ramparts plumed and pallid, a winged odor went away. Wanderers in that happy valley, through two luminous windows, saw spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law, round about a throne where sitting Prophyrogen in state his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen. And all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door, through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore, a troop of echoes, whose sweet duty was but to sing, in voices of surpassing beauty, the wit and wisdom of their king. But evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate. Ah, let us mourn, for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate. And round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of the old time entombed. And travelers now within the valley through the red linton windows see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody, while like a ghastly rapid river through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh, but smile no more. As we see with Poe, often beauty and greatness fall into ruin and darkness think a fitting beginning to what we have in store this week. And now we move on to a tale by Hoffman, The Stolen Reflection. Once upon a time, there was a student named Erasmus Spicker, or Rasmus, as his friends called him. He lived in Germany, and to complete his education, his parents decided to send him on a tour of Europe. He took leave of them and went to see his betrothed, Anne, before setting out on his travels with his friend Frederick. Goodbye, my dear Rasmus, said his sweetheart, shedding a tear or two as she kissed him. Take care of yourself. Don't forget me, and always remain true and faithful. <laughs> as if I could forget you, exclaimed Rasmus as he climbed into the coach, and he certainly meant it. The two young men traveled happily through Switzerland and Italy until they came to the lovely city of Florence. Once there, they forgot that they had been sent to look at historical buildings and galleries full of art treasures, and instead they spent their time at feasts and galas. Now there lived in the city a very clever but very wicked magician who passed himself off as a doctor. His name was Depertuto. He had a daughter who was just as wicked and skilled in sorcery, but she was so beautiful that very few suspected she was a witch. 
Their favorite trick was to steal shadows and reflections from people and use them for their own evil ends. One evening, there was a party in a paved garden full of orange and jasmine trees, among which were gleaming marble statues and fountains throwing up silvery sprays of water. Though all the other young men had brought a partner, Rasmus was alone. He was sitting watching the dancers and thinking of Anne, when he noticed in the bushes a statue more beautiful than all the rest. On looking closer, he saw it was a girl dressed in white, with a necklace and bracelets of finely wrought gold about her neck and arms. Rasmus felt sure anyone so beautiful and so richly dressed must be a princess. Why are you sitting by yourself? she asked, going up to him. I have no partner, said Rasmus. Dance with me, said the beautiful maiden. Rasmus was not a very good dancer, but all clumsiness left him when he touched the maiden's hand, and as he danced he seemed to be floating on air. Don't forget Anne, Frederick reminded him when they left the girls for a moment to fetch refreshments. You've spent all that evening with the same girl. I believe she is Julietta, the daughter of a wily magician. Rasmus thought of Anne and wished she were with him. All the same, he could not desert his partner in the middle of the evening. He was sure that anyone as beautiful as Julietta could not be wicked, whoever her father was. When the party was over, he asked if he might escort Julietta home. In a strange manner, with timid glances over her shoulder, she refused his offer, saying her servant would accompany her and that no one must know where she lived. All this was because she was sure his curiosity would make him follow her and fall into the trap she and her father had laid. After leading him a fine dance up and down many tortuous alleys, she entered a tall, dark house. Rasmus stood outside, wondering where he was and how he would find his way home. By the time he had fallen well under the witch's spell and had quite forgotten Anne. He looked round and found by his side a tall, lean man with a great hawk's nose, dark, gleaming eyes, and an evil, twisted mouth. He was wearing a vivid red coat with glittering steel buttons. "'You're a comic-looking little fellow,' said the man in a high, hard voice, and gave a mirthless laugh. <laughs> "'What odd clothes you wear!' "'I am a German and dress in the German fashion,' answered Rasmus crossly. "'It's very rude to pass remarks about other people's appearance, and besides, I don't see what business it is of yours.' <laughs> don't you now, said the man with a malicious chuckle. Rasmus turned about to find a way out of the alley, and when he looked back, the strange man had vanished. I must be dreaming, thought Rasmus. Perhaps Frederick is right, and sorcerers and witches do live hereabout. At that moment, Julietta appeared on a balcony above, calling frantically for help. Sure that it was the evil old man in the red coat who was trying to harm her, Rasmus opened the door of the house and rushed in. There on the stairs was an ugly young man with a dagger in his hand. With a great leap, Rasmus was on him, but he could feel nothing under his hands, yet the fellow crumpled up as if hit, toppled down the stairs, and lay in a heap on the floor. "'Ah, you have killed him!' cried a shrill voice, and there in the doorway was the man in the scarlet coat. He had a dagger, explained Rasmus, but when he looked down at the fallen man, there was no dagger to be seen. I don't think I touched him, he continued. I couldn't feel anything. Well, he's dead right enough, said the tall man. This man, of course, was the magician, was the magician Depertuto, and the body on the floor was not real but merely one of the stolen reflections, forced by magic to do as it was told. Rasmus did not know this, and could not understand how he had killed a man he could not feel. He was very frightened, for he saw what looked like a body lying on the floor, and in Florence the law was very strict against fighting and dueling. Now that the dagger had vanished, it would be useless to say he had struck in self-defense, nor could he expect anyone to believe such a strange story as his. 
Oh, what have you done? cried Julietta, coming down the stairs. You must fly from the city before you are arrested. I didn't mean to kill him, protested Rasmus. I hardly touched him. Who will believe that? said Julietta. There was a loud knocking on the door, and voices called to them to open in the name of the law. It's the watch, cried Julietta. Fly, fly at once. How can I leave without being seen? asked Rasmus, in despair. I can help you, said the crafty Depertuto. You must give me your reflection. My reflection? exclaimed Rasmus, in surprise. How can I give you that? It goes wherever I go, and I see it every time I look in a mirror or a pool of water. That is quite easy if you are sure you are willing, said Dapper Tuto, looking very pleased. I'm rather fond of it, protested Rasmus. I should miss it very much, and I don't see what use it can be to you. I can make the watch believe it is you, said Dapper Tuto. While they are carrying it off to prison, you can slip away. Rasmus still hesitated. He did not like the idea of parting with a reflection that seemed as much a part of him as his hand. All the same, he did not want to go to prison. The knocking was repeated, and greatly alarmed, he agreed. Julietta led him to a gilt-framed mirror that stood on a small table with tall red candles burning on either side. There he saw himself clearly reflected. Do you give up your reflection of your own free will? asked the magician. Uh, yes, I, I give it to you, said Rasmus, grudgingly. But when the knocking grew louder, he added loudly, I give it up willingly. At once, his reflection stepped out of the mirror. Taking it firmly by the arm, Dapper Tuto led it to a cupboard and, pushing it inside, slammed the door, then turned the key and pocketed it. This way, said Julietta, showing Rasmus out of a door that led into an alley at the back of the house. If Rasmus had left by the front door, he would have seen it was not the watch, and that the knocking was just another of the magician's tricks. It took him some time to find his way out of the dark alleys, and when he did, he was careful to keep in the shadows of wider streets. Presently, a young man came swinging along, singing lightheartedly, and by good fortune, it was Frederick. Rasmus poured out his story, giving a vivid description of the man with the dagger as a fierce, evil-looking creature, but he did not dare say anything about selling his reflection in return for his safety. Frederick agreed it needed great courage to tackle such a villainous fellow, but he also scolded Rasmus for ignoring the warning about the magician and his daughter. He soon found a fast horse, and saw that Rasmus was well away from the city by the time the dawn broke. After some miles, Rasmus began to feel safer, so he stopped at a large inn to have a meal and rest his horse. As the mail coach was changing horses, the parlor was crowded with the passengers. There was only one empty chair at the dining table, and Rasmus sat down without noticing a mirror hung just behind him. When the landlord came to the table to take the orders, he chanced to glance in the mirror and saw that in it the chair was still empty. He gazed at Rasmus in astonishment, then grabbed him by the arm and turned him round to face the mirror. At once there was a cry of dismay from everyone. He has no reflection! He has no reflection! He must be a wizard or an evil spirit! Rasmus fled from the inn, determined to keep a lookout for mirrors and avoid them in the future. Even so, he found that when he came to the next town, the news had preceded him, and he was ordered to report to the authorities, accompanied by his reflection, or leave at once. As he hurried away, a crowd of street urchins followed him, crying, Where's your reflection? Did you sell it to the devil? Are you the devil? After that, he traveled by a roundabout route, avoiding towns, and when forced to go into an inn, he sat always in the darkest corner. By the time his hometown was reached, he was used to avoiding mirrors and doing without his reflection. 
Shaving was certainly very difficult, and, as he did not dare to go to a barber's, he cut himself so often that his face was a patchwork of sticking plaster. Once home, he invented an excuse for having left Florence so soon, and all went well until one day when he was visiting his sweetheart, Anne. She looked at him and began to laugh. <laughs> You look so comical with all that plaster on your face. And now you have a smut on your nose, see? She said, and held up her little pocket mirror. With a cry, she let it drop. There's no reflection. No reflection, said Rasmus, laughing and trying to appear as if mislaying a reflection were an everyday thing. <laughs> That's nothing to lose. It's quite worthless, and looking at it too much makes one conceited. Go away cried Anne. Either you are not my Rasmus, or if you are, you have been dabbling in black magic. Please, listen to me, begged Rasmus, catching hold of her as she tried to rush out of the room. Please, listen, and I will tell you all that happened to me in Florence. And so Rasmus told Anne of his adventure, but she looked very grave. It was difficult to know whether a man without a reflection would be quite truthful. I love you very much, Rasmus, said Anne, but I don't care to marry a man without a reflection. You must see that it would be very awkward. People will either laugh at you or distrust you. You won't know when your face is dirty, and it's no wonder you always cutting yourself when you shave. When you have succeeded in finding your reflection, I will marry you. In the meantime, Set out on your travels again, and don't forget to bring me a present when you come back. With that, she kissed him and pushed him out of the door. Rasmus did not have to travel far to look for his reflection. Depertuto and his daughter had been banished from Florence by its duke, who had heard of their spells and wickedness. Still, Intent on mischief, they had followed Rasmus to Germany and settled in a house not far from his. As Rasmus left Anne, he found Depertuto in his scarlet coat and glittering buttons walking by his side. It is a pleasure to see you, said the magician, taking Rasmus by the arm and hurrying him along the street. Julietta will be delighted to see you. She spends quite a lot of time gazing at your reflection and sighing for you. I want my reflection back, said Rasmus, trying to shake off the long, thin fingers that grasped his arms. Poof! A reflection is worth nothing, said Dapper Tuto. Who would turn down a man for a mere reflection? My sweetheart will not marry me until I get it back, explained Rasmus. A silly girl! <laughs> exclaimed the magician. She cannot love you truly. Now Julietta likes you just as much without your reflection. But it is Anne I want to marry, declared Rasmus. Ha, here we are, said Depertuto, hustling him into a tall house as dark as the one in Florence. There was Julietta, as beautiful as ever, and by her side the magic mirror standing on a side table. As her green eyes stared into his, he began to fall under her spell. He found himself wondering whether Dapper Tuto was not right in saying Anne was a silly girl, who could not really love him if she made such a fuss over a mere reflection. Certainly, Julietta was very beautiful. Marry my daughter, and I will return your reflection, said the magician. Very well said Rasmus, quite overcome by their spells. I will marry Julietta, but I must have my reflection. There is one thing you must do first, said the magician. You must give me Anne's reflection in place of your own. How could I do that? asked Rasmus, quite bemused. With this mirror, said Julietta, taking it from the table and handing it to him. But she will never give up her reflection, protested Rasmus. I gave up, I gave mine up myself. 
I will give you a bottle containing a very powerful drug, said Dapper Tuto, holding out a small bottle containing a strong, sweet-smelling liquid. Put a few drops in a cup of chocolate or coffee, and she will do what you tell her. Rasmus took the bottle and the mirror and set out for Anne's house. The servant said her mistress was upstairs, changing her dress, and showed Rasmus into the parlor. While he was waiting, his curiosity was roused by the bottle in his hand. He took out the stopper and was about to sniff the contents, when Anne's pet bird flew down onto his wrist and pecked at the bottle. Immediately it fell to the ground, turned to a stone image of a bird. Rasmus sprang to his feet and threw the bottle out the window, where it broke into pieces, sending out a strange, sweet smell. I defy you, Dapper Tuto, cried Rasmus as the spell weakened. Julietta, avaunt! I have come to my senses, and I will have no more to do with you. So you have come back, cried Anne, coming into the room at that moment, and you have brought me a present. What a lovely mirror! Do let me see. No, no, cried Rasmus, holding it against himself so that she could not look in the glass. With a crackle of lightning, Dapper Tuto and Julietta appeared in the room. If you will not do my bidding, you must give back my mirror, shouted the magician. Never, cried Rasmus. It has wrought enough evil. You shall never have it back. The mirror, screeched Julietta. Her beauty had fallen from her, and she was now a hideous witch. The hand that clutched his arm burned like fire. No, shouted Rasmus. Not now I know how wicked you are. Shaking off her hand, he rushed across the room with Dapper Tuto after him. For a few moments they struggled together. Then Rasmus succeeded in tearing himself free. Lifting the mirror high above his head, he dashed it on the floor, where it broke into splinters that he ground to even smaller bits with his heel. With howls of rage, the two evil magicians changed to black ravens that flew out the window, leaving behind a trail of foul smoke. From the shattered mirror rose the reflections that had been stolen from dozens of men. They wandered round the room looking for a real mirror to climb in, but there was only one, and that was over the mantelpiece. There were so many of them, and they were so impatient that they could not all get in at once, and pushed and fought one another. The reflection that belonged to Rasmus was fluttering about at the back of the crowd, like a frightened butterfly trying to get through a shut window. Come here, cried Rasmus, making a grab at it and missing. I'll show you where there is another mirror. The frightened reflection thought another magician was attacking it, and running across the room, it jumped out of the window. Come back, shouted Rasmus, climbing over the window sill. By this time, the reflection was halfway down the road, and Rasmus gave chase. Come back! I have a mirror! cried Anne, and she too climbed out the window, but her skirts delayed her. So they ran, down the streets, and across the town, and out into the country. Who caught up home, and which of them tired first? I cannot say. And for all I know, they are still running round the world. The reflection first, Rasmus next. And last of all, Anne, with her little pocket mirror. Hmm. Certainly not the darkest uh, pursuit tales we will cover today. Man's faithfulness, or lack thereof, can lead to dire consequences. And the good advice of a friend can oftentimes be invaluable. Had Rasmus simply listened to Frederick or remained steadfast for Anne, none of this ever would have happened. But then, we wouldn't have a story either, would we? Hmm. Next, something a bit more uh, violent. <laughs> we move on now to Bluebeard from Peralt. 
Once upon a time, there lived a man who possessed fine houses in town and in the country, dishes and plates of silver and gold, furniture all covered in embroidery, and carriages all gilded. But unfortunately, the man's beard was blue, and this made him so ugly and fearsome that all the women and girls, without exception, would run away from him. Nearby there lived a noble lady who had two daughters of the greatest beauty. The man asked her permission to marry one or other of them, leaving it to her to decide which daughter she would give to him. Neither of them wanted him, and each said that the other one could be his wife, for they could not bring themselves to marry a man with a blue beard. What put them off even more was that he had already been married several times, and nobody knew what had become of the wives. Bluebeard, in order to get better acquainted, took them and their mother, with three or four of their best friends, and some young men who lived in the neighborhood, to visit one of his country houses, where they stayed for a whole week. They had outings all the time, hunting parties, fishing trips, and banquets. Nor did they ever go to sleep, but spent all the night playing practical jokes on one another. And they enjoyed themselves so much that the younger of the two sisters began to think that their host's beard was not as blue as it had been, and that he was just what a gentleman should be. As soon as they were back in town, it was settled that they should marry. After a month had passed, Bluebeard told his wife that he had to go away for at least six weeks to another part of the country on an important business matter. He told her to make sure that she enjoyed herself properly while he was away, to invite her friends to stay and to take them out into the country if she wanted to, and not to stint herself wherever she was. Here are the keys of the two big storerooms, he said. The keys for the cupboards with the gold and silver dinner service that is not for every day, and for my strong boxes with my gold and silver coins, and for my jewel boxes, and here is the master key for all the rooms. As for this small key here, it will unlock the private room at the end of the long gallery in my apartment downstairs. You may open everything and go everywhere, except for this private room, where I forbid you to go. And I forbid it to you so absolutely that if you did happen to go into it, there is no knowing what I might do, so angry would I be. She promised to obey his commands exactly, and he kissed her, got into his carriage, and set off on his journey. Her neighbors and friends came to visit the new bride without waiting to be invited. So impatient were they to see all the expensive things in the house. They had not dared to come while her husband was there because of his blue beard, which scared them. And off they went to look at the bedrooms, the sitting rooms, and the dressing rooms, each one finer and more luxurious than the one before. Then they went up to the storerooms, and words failed them when they saw how many beautiful things there were. Tapestries and beds and sofas, armchairs, side tables, dining tables and mirrors so tall that you could see yourself from head to foot, some with frames of glass, some of silver, and some of silver gilt, which were the most beautiful and splendid that they had ever seen. They kept on saying how lucky their friend was and how much they envied her. She, however, took no pleasure in the sight of all this wealth, because of the impatience that she felt to go and open the door to the private room downstairs. So keen was her curiosity that, without reflecting how rude it was to leave her guests, she went down by a little secret staircase at the back, and she was in such a hurry that two or three times she nearly broke her neck. When the door of the little room was in front of her, she stood looking at it for a while, remembering how her husband had forbidden her to open it, and wondering whether something bad might happen to her if she disobeyed. 
but the temptation was strong, and she could not resist it. So she took the little key, and trembling all over, opened the door. At first she could see nothing, because the shutters were closed. After a few moments she began to see that the floor was all covered in clotted blood, and that it reflected the bodies of several women, dead and tied up along the wall. They were the wives whom Bluebeard had married, and whose throats he had cut one after the other. She nearly died of fright, and the key, which she had taken out of the lock, fell out of her hand. When she had recovered herself a little, she picked up the key again, and locking the door behind her, she went upstairs to her room to try to collect her thoughts. But she was unable to, because the shock had been too great. She noticed that the key was stained with blood, and although she cleaned it two or three times, the blood would not go away. However much she washed it, and even scoured it with sand and pumice, the blood stayed on it. It was a magic key, and there was no way of cleaning it completely. When the blood was removed from one side, it came back on the other. Bluebeard returned from his journey that very night, saying that while he was still on his way, he had received letters telling him that the business he had gone to arrange had already been settled to his advantage. His wife did all she could to make him believe that she was delighted at his returning so soon. The next day he asked for his keys back and she gave them to him, but her hand was trembling so much that he easily guessed what had happened. Why is it, he asked, that the key to my private room is not here with the others? She replied, I, I must have left it upstairs on my table. Then don't forget to give it to me later, said Bluebeard. She made excuses several times, but finally she had to bring him the key. Bluebeard examined it and said to his wife, Why is there blood on this key? I know nothing about it, said the poor woman, as pale as death. You know nothing about it, said Bluebeard. But I do. You have tried to get into my private room. Very well, madam. That is where you will go, and there you will take your place, besides the ladies you have seen. She threw herself at her husband's feet, weeping and pleading to be forgiven, and all her actions showed how truly she repented being so disobedient. So beautiful was she, and in such distress, that she would have moved the very rocks to pity. But Bluebeard's heart was harder than rock. You must die, madam, he said, this very instant. If I must die, she said, looking at him with her eyes full of tears, give me some time to say my prayers to God. I will give you ten minutes, said Bluebeard, and not a moment longer. As soon as she was alone, she called to her sister and said, Sister Anne, for that was her name. Go up to the top of the tower, I beg you, to see if my brothers are coming, for they promised to come today, and if you can see them, make them signal, make them a signal to hurry. Her sister Anne went up to the top of the tower, and the poor woman below cried up to her at every moment, What can you see, sister Anne? Sister Anne, is anyone coming this way? And her sister would reply, all I can see is the dust in the sun and the green of the grass all around. Meanwhile, Bluebeard, holding a great cutlass in his hand, shouted as loud as he could to his wife, Come down from there at once, or else I'll come and fetch you. Please, just a minute longer, his wife answered, and immediately called out, but quietly, What can you see, Sister Anne? Sister Anne, is anyone coming this way? 
And Sister Anne replied, All I can see is the dust in the sun and the green of the grass all around. Down you come at once, Bluebeard was shouting, or I will fetch you down. I'm coming now, his wife kept saying, and then she would call, What can you see, Sister Anne? Sister Anne, is anyone coming this way? And then, her sister Anne replied, I can see a great cloud of dust and it is coming towards us. Is that our brothers on their way? Alas, sister, no, it is only a flock of sheep. Do you refuse to come down? shouted Bluebeard. Just a moment more, his wife answered and called out. What can you see, sister Anne? Sister Anne, is anyone coming this way? I can see, she replied. Two horsemen riding toward us, but they are still a long way off. God be praised, she cried moments later. It's our brothers. I shall wave to them as hard as I can so that they will hurry. Bluebeard began to shout so loudly that the whole house shook. His poor wife came down and fell at his feet in tears with her hair all disheveled. That will not save you, cried Bluebeard. You must die. And taking her hair in one hand and raising his cutlass in the air with the other, he was on the point of chopping off her head. The poor woman, turning towards him and looking at him with despair in her eyes, begged him to give her a minute or two to prepare herself for death. No, no, he said, commend your soul to God, and raising his arm, at that moment, there was heard such a loud banging at the door that Bluebeard stopped short. The door opened, and at once the two horsemen came in. They drew their swords and ran straight at Bluebeard. He recognized them for his wife's brothers. One was a dragoon guard, the other a musketeer. Immediately he ran to escape. But the two brothers went after him so fast that they caught him before he could get out the front door. They cut him open with their swords and left him for dead. His poor wife was almost as dead as her husband without even enough strength to get up and embrace her two brothers. It turned out that Bluebeard had no heirs, so that his wife became the mistress of all his riches. She used some to marry her sister Anne to a young gentleman who had loved her for years. Some she used to buy captain's commissions for her two brothers, and the remainder to marry herself to a man of true worth, with whom she forgot all about the bad times she had had with Bluebeard. appended to this story are a pair of morals. We shall read them and see how we feel. The first. Curiosity is all very well in its way, but satisfy it and you risk much remorse, examples of which can be seen every day. The feminine sex will deny it, of course, but the pleasure you wanted once taken is lost, and the knowledge you look for is not worth the cost. agreed had she not opened the door nothing ill would have befallen her at that time but a man who keeps such secrets and dangles the key in front of his wife tempting her to torment mm. uh, that lack of trust mm, does not sit well with me let us read the second moral and see if it is of a better fit. People with sense who use their eyes, study the world and know its ways, will not take long to realize that this is a tale of bygone days, and what it tells is now untrue. Whether his beard be black or blue, the modern husband does not ask his wife to undertake a task impossible for her to do, and even when dissatisfied, with her he's quiet, he's quiet as a mouse, 
it isn't easy to decide which is the master in the house. I rather like the second one more. And it does seem rather strange that the only reason people found him frightening was the color of his beard. It does make me question the superficiality of our distinctions between one another, the reasons that people find to feel fear and hatred seem to only run skin deep. We must be better. Now, we move on to one of my personal favorites from the Empire of Russia. A tale of Koshai the Deathless. Which, let us be fair, as a name, <laughs> is perhaps one of the best. In a certain country, there once lived a king, and he had three sons, all of them grown up. All of a sudden, Koshai the Deathless carried off their mother. Then the eldest son craved his father's blessing, that he might go and look for his mother. His father gave him his blessing, and he went off and disappeared, leaving no trace behind. The second son waited and waited. Then he too obtained his father's blessing, and he also disappeared. Then the youngest son, Prince Ivan, said to his father, Father, give me your blessing, and let me go and look for my mother. But his father would not let him go, saying, Your brothers are no more. If you likewise go away, I shall die of grief. Not so, father, but if you bless me, I shall go, and if you do not bless me, I shall go. So his father gave him his blessing. Prince Ivan went to choose a steed, but every one that he laid his hand upon gave way under it. He could not find a steed to suit him, so he wandered with drooping brow along the road and about the town. Suddenly there appeared an old woman who asked, why hangs your brow so low, Prince Ivan? Be off, old crone, he replied. If I put you on one of my hands and give it a slap with the other, there will be a little wet left, and that's all. The old woman ran down a by street, came to meet him a second time, and said, Good day, Prince Ivan. Why hangs your brow so low? Then he thought... Why does this old woman ask me? Mightn't she be of use to me? And he replied, Well, mother, because I cannot get myself a good steed. Silly fellow, <laughs> she cried, to suffer not to ask the old woman's help. Come along with me. She took him to a hill and showed him a certain spot and said, Dig up that piece of ground. Prince Ivan dug it up and saw an iron plate with twelve padlocks on it. He immediately broke off the padlocks, tore open a door, and followed a path leading underground. There, fastened with twelve chains, stood a heroic steed which evidently heard the approaching steps of a rider worthy to mount it, and so began to neigh and to struggle until it broke all twelve of its chains. Then Prince Ivan put on armor fit for a hero, and bridled the horse and saddled it with a Circassian saddle. And he gave the old woman money, and said to her, Forgive me, mother, and bless me. Then he mounted his steed and rode away. Long time did he ride. At last he came to a mountain, a tremendously high mountain, and so steep that it was utterly impossible to get up it. Presently, his brothers came that way. They all greeted each other and rode on together till they came to an iron rock, a hundred and fifty poods in weight, and on it was this inscription. Whosoever will fling this rock against the mountain, to him will a way be opened. The two elder brothers 
were unable to lift the rock. But Prince Ivan, at the first try, flung it against the mountain, and immediately there appeared a ladder leading up the mountainside. Prince Ivan dismounted, let some drops of blood run from his little finger into a glass, gave it to his brothers, and said, If the blood in this glass turns black, tarry here no longer. That will mean that I am about to die. Then he took leave of them and went his way. He mounted the hill. What did not he see there? All sorts of trees were there, all sorts of fruit, all sorts of birds. Long did Prince Ivan walk on. At last he came to a house, a huge house. In it lived a king's daughter who had been carried off by Koshai the Deathless. Prince Ivan walked round the enclosure, but could not see any doors. The king's daughter saw there was someone there, came on to the balcony and called out to him. See, there is a chink in the enclosure. Touch it with your little finger. It will become a door. What she said turned out to be true. Prince Ivan went into the house, and the maiden received him kindly, gave him to eat and to drink, and then began to question him. He told her how he had come to rescue his mother from Koshai the Deathless. Then the maiden said, It will be difficult for you to get at your mother, Prince Ivan. You see, Koshai is not mortal. He will kill you. He often comes here to see me. There is his sword, fifty poids in weight. Can you lift it? If so, you may venture to go. Not only did Prince Ivan lift the sword, but he tossed it high in the air. And so he went on his way again. By and by he came to a second house. He knew not where to look for the door. He knew now where to look for the door, and he entered in. There was his mother. With tears did they embrace each other. Here also did he try his strength heaving aloft a ball which weighed some fifteen hundred poids. The time came for Koshai the Deathless to arrive. The mother hid away her son. Suddenly, Koshai the Deathless entered the house and cried out, Foo! Foo! A Russian bone one usen't to hear with one's ears or see with one's eyes, but now a Russian bone has come to the house. Who has been with you? Wasn't it your son? What are you talking about? God bless you. You've been flying to Russia and got the Russian air up your nostrils. That's why you fancy it here, answered Prince Ivan's mother. And then she drew nigh to Koshai, addressed him in terms of affection, asked him about one thing and another, and at last said, Whereabouts is your death, O Koshai? My death, he replied, is in such and such a place. There stands an oak, and under the oak is a casket, and in the casket is a hare, and in the hare is a duck, and in the duck is an egg, and in the egg is my death. Having thus spoken, Koshai the Deathless tarried there a little longer, and then flew away. The time came. Prince Ivan received his mother's blessing and went to look for Koshai's death. He went on his way a long time without eating or drinking. At last he felt mortally hungry and thought, if only something would come my way. Suddenly there appeared a young wolf. He determined to kill it. But out from a hole sprang the she-wolf and, sh and said, don't hurt my little one. I'll do you a good turn. Very good. Prince Ivan let the young wolf go. On he went and saw a crow. Stop a bit, he thought. Here I shall get a mouthful. He loaded his gun and was going to shoot the crow. But the crow exclaimed, Don't hurt me. I'll do you a good turn. Prince Ivan thought the matter over and spared the crow. Then he went farther and came to a sea and stood still on the shore. At that moment a young pike suddenly jumped out of the water and fell on the strand. He caught hold of it and thought, 
for he was half dead with hunger. Now I shall have something to eat. All of a sudden appeared a pike and said, Don't hurt my little one, Prince Ivan. I'll do you a good turn. And so he spared the little pike also. But how was he to cross the sea? He sat down on the shore and meditated. But the pike knew quite well what he was thinking about and laid herself right across the sea. Prince Ivan walked along her back, as if he were going over a bridge, and came to the oak where Koshai's death was. There he found the casket and opened it. Out jumped the hare and ran away. How was the hare to be stopped? Prince Ivan was terribly frightened at having let the hare escape, and gave himself up to gloomy thoughts. But a wolf, the one he had refrained from killing, rushed after the hare caught it, and brought it to Prince Ivan. With great delight he seized the hare, cut it open, and had such a fright, out popped the duck and flew away. He fired after it, but shot all on one side, so again he gave up himself to his thoughts. Suddenly there appeared the crow with her little crows, and set off after the duck, and caught it and brought it to Prince Ivan. The prince was greatly pleased and got hold of the egg. Then he went on his way. But when he came to the sea, he began washing the egg and let it drop into the water. However was he to get it out of the water? An immeasurable depth. Again the prince gave himself up to dejection. Suddenly the sea became violently agitated and the pike brought him the egg. Moreover, it stretched itself across the sea. Prince Ivan walked along it to the other side, and then he set out again for his mother's. When he got there, they greeted each other lovingly, and then she hid him again as before. Presently in flew Koshai the Deathless, and said, Foo, foo, no Russian bone can the ear hear nor the eye see, but there's a smell of Russia here. What are you talking about, Koshai? There's no one with me, replied Ivan's mother. A second time spake Koshai and said, I feel rather unwell. And then Prince Ivan began squeezing the egg, and thereupon Koshai the Deathless bent double. At last Prince Ivan came out from his hiding place, held up the egg and said, There is your death, O Koshai the Deathless. And Koshai fell on his knees before him, saying, Don't kill me, Prince Ivan. Let's be friends. All the world will lie at our feet. But those words had no weight with Prince Ivan. He smashed the egg, and Koshai the Deathless died. Ivan and his mother took all they wanted and started homewards. On their way, they came to where the king's daughter was, whom Ivan had seen on his way and they took her with them too. They went further and came to the hill where Ivan's brothers were still waiting for him. Then the maiden said, Prince Ivan, do go back to my house. I have forgotten a marriage robe, a diamond ring, and a pair of seamless shoes. He consented to do so. But in the meantime, he let his mother go down the ladder as well as the princess, whom it had been settled he was to marry when they got home. They were received by his brothers, who then set to work and cut away the ladder, so that he himself would not be able to get down. And they used such threats to his mother and the princess that they made them promise not to tell Prince Ivan when they got to tell about Prince Ivan when they got home. And after a time, they reached their native country. Their father was delighted at seeing his wife and his two sons, but still he was grieved about the other one, Prince Ivan. But Prince Ivan returned to the home of his betrothed, and got the wedding dress, and the ring, and the seamless shoes. Then he came back to the mountain, and tossed the ring from one hand to the other. Immediately there appeared twelve strong youths, who said, What are your commands? Carry me down from this hill. The youths immediately carried him down. Prince Ivan put the ring on his finger, 
they disappeared. Then he went on to his own country, and arrived at the city in which his father and brothers lived. There he took up his quarters in the house of an old woman, and asked her, What news is there, mother, in this country? What news, lad? You see, our queen was kept in prison by Koshai, the deathless. Her three sons went to look for her, and two of them found her and came back. But the third, Prince Ivan, has disappeared, and no one knows where he is. The king is very unhappy about it. And those two princes and their mother brought a certain princess back with them. And the eldest son wants to marry her, but she declares he must fetch her betrothal ring first, or get one made just as she wants it. But although they have made a public proclamation about it, no one has been found to do it yet. Hmm. Well, mother, go and tell the king that you will make one. I'll manage it for you, said Prince Ivan. So the old woman immediately dressed herself and hastened to the king and said, Please, your majesty, I will make the wedding ring. Make it then, but make it, mother. Such people as you are welcome, said the king. But if you don't make it, off goes your head. The old woman was dreadfully frightened. She ran home and told Prince Ivan to set to work at the ring. But Ivan lay down to sleep, troubling himself very little about it. The ring was there all the time. So he only laughed at the old woman. But she was trembling all over and crying and scolding him. As for you, she said, you're out of the scrape. But you've done for me, fool that I was. The old woman cried and cried until she fell asleep. Early in the morning, Prince Ivan got up and awakened her, saying, Get up, mother, and go out. Take them the ring, and mind, don't accept more than one ducat for it. If anyone asks who made the ring, say you made it yourself. Don't say a word about me. The old woman was overjoyed and carried the ring. The bride was delighted with it. Just what I wanted, she said. So they gave the old woman a dish full of gold, but she took only one ducat. Why do you take so little, said the king. What good would a lot do me, your majesty? If I want some more afterwards, you'll give it me. Having said this, the old woman went away. Time passed, and news spread abroad that the bride had told her lover to fetch her her wedding dress, or else to get one made just at such a one as she wanted. Well, the old woman, thanks to Prince Ivan's aid, succeeded in this matter, too, and took her the wedding dress. And afterwards she took her the seamless shoes also, and would only accept one ducat each time, and always said that she had made the things herself. Well, the people heard that there would be a wedding at the palace on such and such a day, and the day they all anxiously awaited came at last. Then Prince Ivan said to the old woman, Look here, mother, when the bride is just going to be married, let me know. The old woman didn't let the time go unheeded. Then Ivan immediately put on his princely raiment and went out of the house. See, mother, this is what I'm really like, says he. The old woman fell at his feet. Pray forgive me for scolding you, says she. God be with you, says he. So he went into the church, and finding his brothers had not yet arrived, he stood up alongside of the bride and got married to her. Then he and she were escorted back to the palace, and as they went along, the proper bridegroom, his eldest brother, met them. But when he saw that his bride and Prince Ivan were being escorted home together, he turned back again ignominiously. As to the king, he was delighted to see Prince Ivan again, and when he had learned all about the treachery of his brothers, after the wedding feast had been solemnized, he banished the two elder princes, but he made Ivan heir to the throne. There are many variations on this, as with all of our other tales of these types. Um, but this is one of the more common of the Koshai tales. Deathless adversaries with 
their death being a physical object hidden away in a fantastical way, uh, much in the same way that Rasmus's reflection is uh, made physical and taken from him. I think we shall leave it at that. We shall leave Peeps for his own time again. Thank you for joining me tonight. I do hope you have enjoyed it. That all is well with you and continues to be. Until next time, happy reading.